Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Jesus' identity. The interview was held on the 5th of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 2, Part 2. Recently we had some people um, from the media come to visit us mm -hmm. and they personally found many of the things that you talked about very interesting. Mm -hmm. They were quite engaged mm -hmm. and they commented also that you were quite a logical person. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes their families listen to what I have to say. <laughs> However, after they left, they, they claimed that you were in La La Land or mm -hmm. that we were in La La Land. Yeah. Why do you feel that that happened? Why do you feel that this is the case? Well, I, I can't see how the media can claim anything else at this point in time. Because it, to claim that I'm actually sane and logical, which is what most of them believe I am, when they speak, speak with me at least, they would then go against almost everything they personally have learned about Jesus, everything that they personally believe, and everything they know the public has learned about Jesus and believes. Now, for a person of the media to do that, they're going to need to have a lot of courage. And the majority of people in the media, I've found, don't have a huge amount of courage at all. They are feeding the public with what they know the public wants to hear. And in fact, the majority of the media who've had contact with us have not only fed the public with what they want to hear, but have cre created a fiction about us in order to feed the public what they want to hear. In other words, most of what the media claims about us is completely false, actually, as you know. So I find it very interesting that they have to go down this particular route. And I feel the main reason why they go down this route is because they are generally afraid of the public. And ironically, the very public that they say they serve, they are afraid of. It's interesting when we look at what happens with the media. If the media attack us, then the public support the media. If the media agrees with us or treats us kindly, then the public attack the media, which is very interesting. And so therefore, the media have a problem when it comes to our life. And the problem is, if they portray me as a sane, logical person who's claiming that he's Jesus, but not saying that he's God, and saying he's just the same as any other man, and who presents a lot of logical facts about the universe that can be verified through a person's own practice, then people in the public will condemn the media. Because people in the public have a lot of religious beliefs. In fact, there's 1.5 billion people on the planet who believe I am God. Well, Jesus is God, not I am God. Mm. And uh, so therefore have a false belief about Jesus. And there's uh, the others, or uh, many of them believe Jesus never existed, which is also a false belief. And many of them believe that uh, Jesus is anti their own religion, which is also a false belief. <laughs> and if you add all the sum total of all of these false beliefs up on the planet, there's not a single person on the planet who wants to believe that an average person like myself, Alan John Miller, can be Jesus. And that's what I generally find. There's not a single person on the planet who actually believes I am Jesus as a result. So how does that relate to the media? Well, the media have investments in portraying us as people that we are not. They have investments that are driven by their own fears, their fear of, of the public itself and the fear of how their own jobs, their own, you know, what, what their producers will do, what their organisations will do if the members of the media portray us as we actually are. And I see this happening all the time. When there is not a story that's good enough for what they believe it needs to be, they go and create one fictitiously in order to present so-called information to the public, which is not facts at all, but rather just a heap of lies. And why do they do that? Because they want to feed the public with what the public wants to hear. That's the only way in today's media-based society that you gain ratings. 
is by feeding the public with what the public want to hear. Now, unfortunately, what the public wants to hear at this point in time is a lot of dark, it is based on a lot of dark emotions that the public has within them. So the average person on this planet has a lot of very dark emotions, anger, anger, sadness, grief. The sadness and grief isn't as dark as the anger. The anger is often terrifying. You can see their anger often reverts to violence. Average people reverting to violence because of the rage that they are actually in on all sorts of subjects. And of course, this is very terrifying for the average person on the planet. And so the average person on the planet conforms to the other average people on the planet. So they're not attacked by mm. the average person. Now, because I don't conform to what the average person on the planet either believes or accepts as truth, I am going to be the subject of ridicule and attack. It was exactly the same for me in the first century. I was the subject of ridicule and attack by the same kind of people who I am currently ridiculed and attacked by. People in the media are like the people who held public opinion in the first century. The only difference is the media now is a mass media. Right? In the first century, the only form of mass media was the written word, and that was only available generally to people who were very wealthy. In this life, mass media is available to everybody, pretty much everybody, is a, it can access the media. And for that reason, it becomes a powerful tool to feed the public what they want to hear. Now, I'm not interested in feeding the public what they want to hear. I'm only interested in feeding the public what is the truth, what I know to be the truth. That's my only criteria for what I speak of. Now, now, or if I'm asked my personal opinion, I will tell them the truth of my personal opinion. Either one I'm happy to disclose. Now, the average person on the planet doesn't want to hear those things. They neither want to hear my own opinion, nor do they want to hear the truth of what is God's opinion about the universe itself and their own life and their own belief systems and so forth. And for that reason, they project at the media that the media must give them what they want, otherwise they will leave support of the media. And for that reason, the media gives the public generally what they want. So even though the people who come to visit me generally believe that I'm a very sane person who's very logical, and they can't often refute any of the things that I argue about or talk to, to them about, they wish to believe that I'm in La La Land. And there is a primary reason why they wish to believe it, because the alternative is unpalatable. The alternative is that I'm not in La La Land. The alternative is that I am Jesus. And they don't want to accept that. Nobody wants to come out and say that. Otherwise, that will be labelled as idiots and crazy. Right? Nobody wants to do that. So nobody wants to accept the alternative, and that is that I am the person I'm claiming to be. Isn't and that is the main reason why they're ready to ridicule me, call me deceitful, lie about me, and so forth. <clears throat> Just to clarify a few points there, mm -hmm. you're saying that um, basically, unless the media attacks us, the media themselves will get attacked. Will get attacked. Um, second to that, you're sort of saying that the media is engaged in the business of gi of giving people what they want, actually. Yeah. To avoid attack, but also to maintain their financial position in terms well, of advertising. And let's look at what the public really wants. What the public really wants is for their fear to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. That's what the public really wants. The public is addicted to having the fear, their own fear, confirmed. So if their fear is about cults, they want their fear confirmed. Right? They don't care that all I do is go around and do seminars, that I have no cult in my backyard, that I have no people living with me. They don't care about any of those things. They want their fear confirmed. So they want to be told that I'm running a cult, that I have a compound, that none of the things are true. They want to be told these things because then their fear gets confirmed. Right? If all you want is your fear confirmed, then you're going to get a whole, told a whole lot of lies just to have your fear confirmed. And I'm not in the business of doing that, but the media are. Many of the media are. Not all of the media. But we've had interactions with different members of the media that are not like that, but they're not very popular. This is... Yes. Okay. So 
that's what I also wanted to bring up with you. Um, recently we've had some other media where people were not... Uh, where the media themselves was not attacking. Were not attacking and they didn't tell lies about us, no. for example. They, no. they still asked many what I felt, felt were ludicrous questions. <laughs> In other words, not logical questions if they really truly thought about them. But uh, they weren't attacking and they weren't belittling when they had their personal engagement with us. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that's probably a fairer way of dealing with the media. However, many of their listeners were not happy with that. They believed they, they should treat us with a lot of disrespect as a result. And that's because the average person on the planet does treat other people with disrespect and particularly treats other people with disrespect who have different beliefs than they do. Mm. And that's how the average person on the planet operates. And until that changes, I can't see any of the attitudes towards ourselves changing. Does that make sense? Like, well, you're saying that the media is a reflection of the Yes, the you public. can't blame the media for what it does because all it's really doing is feeding the public what they want. And, the only, and it's the same with politicians. You can't blame the politicians for what they do. They're just feeding the public with what they want. You can't blame the religious leaders for what they do. They're just feeding the public with what they want. I'm not in the business of feeding public what they want. That's why I'm generally criticised. I'm not in a business at all, in fact. All I want to do is tell the truth of what I know to be true. That is very unusual on this planet. Most people don't do that. Most people instead tell people what they want to hear. Right? If you wish to only hear what you want to hear, my suggestion is go and find somebody who will do that for you. They're not your friend. They're not even, they don't even love you. They're just manipulating you. That's all they're doing. Because a person who truly loves you will tell you what they know to be true, whether you want to hear it or not. That's what a person who loves you will do. If you're willing to hear it, they will tell you. If you're not willing to hear it, of course, they won't. But they will wish to tell you what is true. And my feelings are, is the public itself, the general person on this planet, has a deep desire to avoid truth. They have a deep desire to avoid personal truth. They have a deep desire to avoid universal truth because it confronts their personal truth. As a result, the average person on this planet does not want to hear the truth. They like hearing the lies. Ironically, though, when somebody tells lies about them, now they're all up in arms. Now they're all upset, right? So they want to have other people hear the truth about them, but they want to hear lies about everything else. And it's very hypocritical, actually. Until that general problem is resolved on the planet, truth will be very difficult to tell on the planet and will also be very difficult to discover because we'll be limited by the lies constantly. We'll be limited by the desire to not hear truth rather than the desire to hear truth. So I feel it's a big problem and uh, we can talk more in another question about why it's such a large problem. But that, that to me is the biggest issue. In order to summarise this question, I feel it's this. It's preferable for most people on the planet to believe I'm delusional, insane, crazy, deceitful, a liar, than it is for them to accept that I am the person I'm claiming to be. And I understand that. I understand all the reasons why they're in that place where they want to believe that I'm not Jesus for all of their own reasons. But just because everyone on this planet doesn't believe I'm Jesus, it doesn't mean that I'm not. In the first century, when I began doing what I was doing, nobody believed I was the Messiah. But now there's literally billions of people in the spirit world who know I am. And that happened over time because of what I taught. Right? So, so it's the same now. I, I just feel it's exactly the same now. We have huge investments. The average person has huge investments in not believing anything other than bad about me because of my claim that I'm Jesus. And they have huge emotional investments in doing so. And until they're willing to confront such emotional investments, they're not going to listen to a word I say, even though it is very logical and even though it makes a lot of sense. 
And even though they've never heard it before, they will not listen to it until they break through these barriers of belief that occur as a result of their own indoctrination. So my suggestion to people is break through those barriers as soon as you're able because without breaking through those barriers, you're not going to resolve any issue of truth. And, uh, and I hope that at some point you do it while you're on earth. But if you don't do it while you're on earth, you'll be able to do it in the spirit world because all of those people that I said could come to you and confirm my identity, they'll be able to come to you if you ask them to and confirm who I am. They, they won't have any trouble doing so. And it will only get down to what you believe in the end, the sincerity that you feel in those individuals as to whether you're going to believe them or not. Just as it really gets down to whether you believe I'm sincere or not as to whether you're going to believe me about my identity. In your opinion, how many people who listen to you believe completely that you are Jesus and have resolved this issue within themselves? None. Not one. Um, if I think about all the people I've personally spoken to over the last you know, nine years, it's probably around about 20,000 people or so. Of those 20,000 people, around about, at the moment, about uh, just over 1,000 regularly listen. And so of the 20,000, you could basically say 20,000, there's been 20 times the number of people who have stopped listening than there are people who currently listen. Mm -hmm. right. Now, of those 1,000 people, I would say about 100 donate to us regularly of those 1,000 people. So the majority of people who listen to us regularly do not donate uh, to us at all. Uh, the majority of people just listen. A lot of them listen so that they have something to complain about and, and something to criticise. And a lot of them listen, uh, they feel benefited in their life, but not benefited enough to donate to us or support, to support us. Around 100 or so support us regularly. And of course, we're very thankful to those 100 or so people who do that. Of those 100, probably around 20 of them have started to address the issue of whether I'm Jesus or not. What do you mean by that? Well, there is a lot of emotional reasons uh, or emotional things a person needs to work their way through in order to accept whether I'm Jesus or not. Of those 100, many of them would believe they've resolved the issue of my identity, but the reality is they've only been told by spirits what my identity is. And they themselves have yet to personally resolve the issues regarding my identity. In other words, they have yet to process through the emotional things that they're going to have to process through in order to resolve the question as to whether I am Jesus or not. Now, around 20 people have started to engage that process. And so those 20 people or so um, have really started to put into practice the principles of divine truth in their personal life and they've started to, uh, through their personal practice, realise that the majority of things that I'm teaching are true. And as a result of that, they have a much higher feeling inside of themselves, that's their own feeling, that I am probably the Jesus that I'm claiming to be. Mm -hmm. But none of them have known me for 2,000 years, except for two of those 20 people, yourself and Corny, Cornelius. So two of those 20 people have known me for 2,000 years. But of course, both of you, Corny and yourself, still have yet to resolve a lot of issues with me in terms of uh, your, your personal acceptance of your own um, memories and feelings. And also, you know, being openly able to say to other people that I am Jesus without feeling personally embarrassed or some, some other emotion. And none have actually ever personally fully resolved the issue to the point where they have no more fear about it. And they know for certain that I'm Jesus. And they have no more fear regarding the question. No one on earth has done that at this point. So that bodes well. That's after nine years of speaking publicly. And Is that not... sarcasm? No, no, I'm just, I'm just making fun. I, I find it interesting because I have regularly said to people 
that unless they finish up resolving that particular issue, they will eventually leave the teachings of divine truth. And that is true. Sooner or later, the majority of people will leave the teachings of divine truth because of this one issue, because they cannot believe that I'm Jesus. But if we go back to some earlier questions where we <coughs> discussed the issue of proof, mm -hmm. Uh, we establish pretty much it's impossible to prove to someone who you are. Exactly. So, so it doesn't make any logical sense to leave the teachings because I'm Jesus. Can you see the logic? It doesn't make any logical sense to leave the teachings because I'm saying that I'm Jesus. That you, you need to have a better reason than that really to leave the teachings because there is no way you can prove whether I'm Jesus or not. So it doesn't make any logical sense to leave the teachings because you don't believe that I'm Jesus. Leave the if you're going to leave the teachings, leave the teachings because the teachings don't make any sense. Leave the teachings because, you know, of some other reason other than he's saying he's Jesus and I can't believe him. Because that makes no logical sense because you can't prove or disprove that. So why leave a teaching when you can't prove the reason why you left? It makes no logical sense. But just to clarify, you're saying that most people are going to leave because they don't resolve emotionally who you are. Because they, or they cannot get away from the fact that I'm claiming that I'm Jesus and that they cannot get away from the fact that they don't believe it. And, and sooner or later, I say something that challenges them. And of course, not believing that I'm Jesus or believing that I'm not Jesus helps you not deal with the challenge. In other words, the majority of people, when I say something to them that challenges them personally, emotionally, they revert to, he's not Jesus, rather than thinking, is what he said about that right or not? Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to go, yes, what he said about that was right. And that then means a large change in their life. They don't want to do that. And so what they do instead is they always hold this issue of whether I'm Jesus in abeyance for a later out. It's an out clause. It gives everyone a great out clause, right? Because it gives them a way to escape from the truth if they need it, if they believe they need it. And this is what I find happening constantly. People constantly leave the divine truth, not for any other reason than saying that they don't believe that I'm Jesus, but the reality is that's not the real reason they left. The real reason they left was because I said something that challenges their very way of life, their very core of being. And we'll talk about this in a later question perhaps. And, and as a result of the challenge, they then use the excuse, he's saying he's Jesus and I don't believe he is, as the reason for leaving. And yet that's illogical because it's impossible to prove that I'm not Jesus, just as it's impossible to prove that I am. And this question, though, is speaking about people who've, who believe completely mm -hmm. that you are Jesus. Yes, there's no one. There's no one. But, you, but in your answer, you implied <coughs> that people could reach a point of complete belief that you are. Yes. But they're not Explain going to do to it by, by any evidence other than the two evidences that I have already presented, which is, well, there's probably three. The first one is I present an accurate record of my own life, just like anybody on this planet can present generally an accurate record of their own life. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that record is corroborated by other people who have been with me through my life whether that is now or in the first century or in the spirit world or all three. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, that other people in the spirit world that they cannot see corroborate this evidence. Right? They're the only, that's the only evidence I can provide that, that, and it's the only evidence that anybody can provide that they are the person they actually are. So are you saying that to emotionally resolve who you are, people must consult these three things? Yes. And that's the only way to emotionally resolve who you are. Yes. And are you And in other words, they're going to have to ask me about my life. Just like if I had to resolve who Igor is, I would ask him about his life. It's the most logical thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's your life, Igor? Tell me about your life. How did you grow up? Where, where, what, you know, where, who are your parents? What happened? What happened here? What happened there? What happened during this life? You know, these books that were written about you say that you did this. Is that true? This is the kind of dialogue that I would have with Igor if I wanted to find out about Igor's life. 
-hmm. I would then be able to talk to and communicate with the people who know Igor from his life and I would ask them the same kind of things. And I would ask any, this is what I would do if I wanted to find out the truth about whether Igor, it, whether Igor is Igor. In other words, if I didn't want to believe that Igor is saying that he's Igor and I didn't want to believe him and I wanted some evidence, this is what I would do. Ironically, this is not what people do with me. And the reason why they don't do it with me is because they have all these investments already in me not being Jesus. They don't want to, they don't want to consider that as a possibility. So I don't get asked questions about my life. I don't get asked questions about what happened here, what happened there, who did I know. I don't get asked any of these questions because nobody believes it's true in the first place. Right? That's why I don't get asked. And yet, if you think about how do you get to know any other person, that's exactly how you get to know them. And I find this is a remarkable thing about you know, people generally in their dealings with me. How they treat the average person is completely different to how they treat me. So from what you're saying there, though, I, it appears that people would need to deal with the emotional reasons why they do not approach you in that way. Exactly. Before they will then approach you in that way. Exactly. And once they approach you in that way, then at least they have more evidence with which to resolve the issue. Exactly. Without, without having an open approach to somebody. So if I, if I hear Igor saying, I'm Igor Shakhanov, and I hear him saying it on telly, I go, I don't believe him. Like, how many people would actually even consider doing that? The majority of people would never consider doing that except with Jesus, mm. by the way. But the majority of people, when an average person gets up, uh, and I feel I'm an average person, but uh, apparently I'm not, according to everybody else. And, and the average person gets up in front of a town and says, I'm Igor Shakhanov and I'm saying this and this is what happened in my life. The average person would go, no worries, I accept that. Uh, unless there is evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. With me, that's not the case. What they do is, no, that's all rubbish unless you can provide me evidence to the contrary. Now, I can provide a lot of evidence to the contrary that it's not rubbish, but nobody wants to hear it because they've already made up their mind before they've even spoken or before they even hear anything more. They've already made up their mind that I'm an idiot. They've already made up their mind that I'm a nutcase, that, that I'm delusional, that I'm whatever they want to believe I am, deceitful or whatever. They've already made up their mind. And... As a result, they never get to ask the questions that would normally be asked in order to satisfy their own curiosity to find out the truth. And I find that's ironic. Yeah, <laughs> it's ironic. I also find it's very interesting because when I see people approaching this issue of emotionally resolving who you are, I don't see them looking to your life. No. I see them looking to miraculous signs, mm -hmm. um, your ability to heal, mm -hmm. your ability to read their mind, your capacity to love even, any of these things, they use them as a measure mm -hmm. and not actually the life that you've had and your ability to recount it and the ability of others around you to say, I was there during exactly. that life. Um, I think most people feel that in order to emotionally resolve who you are, they have to see proof which is not necessarily in alignment with what you're even promising to be able to do. No, and also it's not proof. It's not actually proof. Like me doing a miracle is not proof that I'm Jesus. It's just proof that I can do a miracle, right? Me reading a person's mind is not proof that I'm Jesus. It's just proof that I can read their mind. Me understanding their emotions is not proof that I'm Jesus. It's just proof that I can understand emotions. None of it's proof. Mm. And I guess you are coming from the knowledge that you are a regular guy, a child of God, mm -hmm. just like everyone else, exactly. who has a particular passion yep. for God and teaching God's truth and a deep desire to connect with God. Yes. You know this. And I feel that everyone else has the potential to do the same. And on top of that, if I was finding out about somebody else, I would ask them the questions about their life. In fact, I do, as you know, ask mm -hmm. them always questions about their life. What happened here? What happened there? What happened here when you were growing up? What? This is how I get to know them. Nobody does that with me. Because they don't view you in that same way. They don't view you in the way that you view you. That's what I was trying Not to get only at. That, they, they, they don't see view that... me. They don't, they don't think the normal rules of engagement apply to me. So it's not only that they don't, because they, they already believe that I'm a liar. They already believe that I'm delusional before we begin. 
So before we begin an interaction, if somebody, if I believe you're delusional before I begin an interaction with you, right, it's highly unlikely I'm going to listen to anything you say about your own life, about the life of others, about whatever was the truth of what happened, anything. I'm not going to believe anything. That's the out clause. The out clause is I don't have to believe you because you're delusional or because you're deceitful or whatever. I don't even give you the chance to show whether you're deceitful or delusional or not. Mm. I just go ahead and make that judgment call. Yeah, and this occurs even for people who attend our seminars regularly. All the time. Yeah. There are people who have been attending our seminars for six years who still do it with me, mm -hmm. who still treat me like this. They have, no idea, they have no idea about my personal life at all, none whatsoever. They think they do because of what they've heard, but they have no idea. They don't know how I grew up. They don't know my family. They wouldn't be able to even name my brother's name or my sister's name. The majority of people who know me right now wouldn't be able to name my brother or sister's name. Right? They wouldn't know, even be able to name my children's name. Right? <laughs> That's the reality. That's how little they want to know about my life. And the reason why they want to know so little about my life is because... Anything they find out about my life might challenge their viewpoint that I'm delusional or that I'm a nutcase or that I'm deceitful. And they don't want that belief challenged. They want to remain in that belief. And why do they want to remain in the belief? Because it helps them get away with anything that I might say that might be challenging. So if I say something to them that's challenging, they can go, he's just an idiot or he's just deceitful or he's just manipulative or he's just whatever without there being any proof of such things. Right? They can say it because it lets them off the hook with regard to listening to what I've said. And I find that's the primary reason why most people don't want to hear what I said. Mm -hmm. And this is the primary reason why nobody really believes who I am because nobody really has really engaged the question about what's happened in my life. Even you haven't, if you think about it. Right? And, and it's only recently that you've started engaging those kind of questions, right? And and this is the because you didn't want to have your experience tainted, and I understand that. But at the end of the day, how do you get to know somebody really without engaging all of these questions? You can't, really. And I find the, the, the irony of it quite remarkable in a lot of ways, in that, in that this general concept that the normal way of getting to know someone doesn't apply to Jesus. The way of getting to know Jesus is getting to perform a miracle for you. Mm -hmm. Then you know him. No, you don't. You don't know anything. You don't know anything about me if I perform a miracle, whether I could or not. All you know in that moment is that I can perform the miracle that you wanted. That's all you know. Nothing else. But people have a whole lot of <coughs> preconceptions about your nature and character anyway. Of course. They believe that if you did the miracle, that would prove that you're the Jesus that they already have a preconception about, which it, and it's none not going of to this be. is the, the, actually you. Yeah, the conception of Jesus on this planet 2,000 years away from when I was on earth before is completely different to the person I was. The conception of Jesus on this planet at the moment is terrible, to be frank. Like, I'm a much better person than, it, than people, the average person believes Jesus to be. Because the average person believes Jesus would come and murder millions of people. Of course, I'm never going to murder millions of people. I'm not a genocidal maniac, you know, like... But even in the first century, most people we knew didn't know you? No, I agree. They didn't know your character and no. nature? Oh. No, they just, again, did the same thing as what they do with me now, and that is base it on, you know, their own... Well, I challenge so many things, let's face it, in terms of inside of a person when they speak to me. And not because I want to, but just because the truth challenges people automatically, that people become frightened, scared, angry, abusive, and all these other things before they want to know me. And I feel like, well, that's fine if that's what they want to choose to do. But don't think you know me from a book. Don't think you know me because you have some kind of guess of what I might do, right? The reality is, unless you are at one with God yourself, you don't know me. And that's what I said in the first century as well. Unless your father is my father, in the same manner that I have, am the son of my father, in the sense that one with God, unless your father is my father in that manner, that you are at one with God, you will not know me. Because you won't know what I'm going to do in any circumstance or situation. Mm. You won't be able to guess. Because when a person's at one with God they would choose to do things completely different than the average person on the planet. 
Yeah, because, only because the average person on the planet is so far from God exactly. right now. If, and if also we were so all, steeped in fear. If we're all closer to God and had less fear, then a person at one with God yep. wouldn't be so out of the ordinary. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the average person on the planet, I understand where they're coming from. I understand that they've got all of these preconceptions, thousands of years of them, in fact, all added up into them, all, con all converging into their mind. And uh, they've got book, a book, four of them, in fact, in the Gospel account, that they believe are an accurate reflection of my nature and character, which are not. And, you know, they, they've got all these things that they reckon that I was like this or like that. I, you know, I get so many people tell me, I know you're not Jesus because... Jesus would do this or Jesus would do that. Oh, goodness me. Like, you know, how arrogant is that? Telling Jesus that you know he's not Jesus because your concept of Jesus 2,000 years removed from when I existed on earth is now true? How can you believe that your concept of somebody who lived 2,000 years ago is true even? How could you have enough, that much arrogance to believe that? Honestly, it's got to be, you've got to be extremely arrogant to believe that your concept of somebody who lived 2,000 years ago is accurate because there's been so much distortion historically of any single person who's ever lived through history, let alone a person who has as much, shall we call it, infamy or fame mm -hmm. as I do. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, you're just not going to have an accurate concept of me at all. So stop believing that you do and just start listening instead. That's my suggestion. Have a listen instead of, you know, worrying about, you know, whether I'm going to take your money. I do everything for free. How can I take your money? Like, don't worry about that. Listen to what's being said and listen to the reasonableness of it. Put, put it into practice in your day-to-day -day life. You don't even have to pay me a cent to do that. Go and do it before you make any judgments, rather than just making judgments on face value, which is all based around your own emotional inability to cope with the fact that I'm Jesus. <laughs> and that's what I feel the majority of people need to do. They, they have an emotional inability to cope with the fact that I'm Jesus. That's all. And that's what's driving everything. And my suggestion to them is deal with that. Like, there's no way you can prove that I'm not Jesus, so deal with that. There's no way I'm going to prove that I am. Deal with that too. Right? If you want proof, it can only be established using the same method that you can establish your own identity to other people, and that is that people who knew you from the time of your birth to right now have to testify to your identity. And sooner or later, that's going to happen with me. So, and also, I can testify to my own identity through my own experience, which is what the average person can do. So unless you're willing and prepared to accept those things, you're not, no matter what I do, whatever miracles I perform, I could levitate in the sky, wouldn't make any difference. All it does is prove that I can levitate. It doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. People are just terrified, aren't they, that if they believe that you're Jesus, <clears throat> that somehow this will affect their ability to make rational decisions and use their own will. Yes, I, I'm totally confused about that, compared, considering the fact that I'm a very rational person and encourage people to use their own will. Um, I feel, though, a lot of it is about confrontation of beliefs. Honestly, the majority of people who come to me and say to me, I don't want to listen to divine truth anymore because you're saying you're Jesus and I know you're not. I go, yeah, you don't know I'm not. But it's impossible to know that I'm not in your condition or in your position. Impossible. You've not asked anybody. You don't, you know, none of the people who I knew you, you have you ever spoken to. So of course you don't know whether I am or not. So what's your real reason? Mm. And the real reason is often that they've been confronted at some level, which we can talk about later. There's a lot of ways that people get confronted. And I think there's a question later that we'll talk about the ways in which people get confronted and how they get confronted through their interaction with the divine truth. Mm. Mm. Yeah, lots more I could say on that issue, but let's move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've had at least 20,000 people listen to you and most of them no longer listen. What do most people say to you when they leave your teachings? Well, yes, I've had 20,000 people listen to me in this life face-to-face, -face, shall we say. I, obviously, millions and millions of people have listened to me over history <laughs> But 20,000 people have listened to me face to face in this life. Without exception, 
every single person who's now no longer listening to me, have, has, who has told me why they're no longer listening to me, has said, they don't listen to me anymore because they can't believe that I'm Jesus. Or to put it more succinctly, they usually say, they know that I'm not Jesus. And that's why they don't listen to me anymore. They don't not listen to me because what I say is illogical. They don't say that it's because they can't believe it. They don't, they, it's only the stuff about being Jesus they feel they can't believe. And they say categorically that they know that I'm not Jesus. And I think, yeah, I'm sorry, but you're being really illogical now because there is no way that you can know that I'm not Jesus. Unless you were with me in my first century life, with me throughout my spirit life, saw my return through your spirit eyes and then returned to earth with me and then have lived this life with me, there is no way that you can prove that I'm not Jesus. So it's an illogical statement to say that you're not listening to me anymore because I'm not Jesus. The reason why you're not listening to me anymore is because I said something that confronts you and you don't want to listen to it anymore. So be honest about that. Say, yeah, I don't like what you said about this, so I don't want to hear anymore. That's fine. <laughs> Do that. Because it's impossible for you to prove that I'm not Jesus and it's impossible for you to know that I'm not Jesus. Impossible. And while it's like that, um, any time you say to me that you are not listening anymore or you've refused to listen right from the beginning because I'm saying that I'm Jesus, you are being very illogical and unreasonable. It's a very unreasonable thing to do. Now, I think it's very reasonable to say to me, I'm not listening to you anymore because you don't make any sense. <laughs> or I'm not listening to you anymore because I believe you're a scoundrel and because I've got proof that you are. Or I'm not listening anymore because you lie all the time and I can't abide lies or whatever. Now, that would make sense to me. Of course, none of those things are true, but it would make sense to me if you said those things or that you believed them even. Then it would so to say, I'm not listening to you anymore because I know that you're Jesus. That I know you're not sorry, Jesus. Not Jesus. Mm. And I feel it's quite amazing that the majority of people think that that is a valid reason to, to not listen to somebody. I listen to everybody and they're not Jesus. Like, you know, when the eagle comes and talks to me in my house and says to me, AJ, I think you should do this. I go, yeah, that's a good idea, actually. I listen to him. Because I evaluate everything that's said to me based on its logic, based on its reasonableness, based on the love that's in it, based on the truth that's in it, not based on the individual that's telling me it even. And I don't, so I don't expect Igor to be Jesus before I listen to him. So why would you expect me to be Jesus before you listen to me? That doesn't make any logical sense either. So I feel there's a lot of illogical behaviour when it comes to people's assessment of my identity. <laughs> when most people leave your teachings, they say it's because they know that you're not Jesus. Mm. What reasons do they give you as to why they can't believe that you're Jesus? Um, I would say the majority of people who say that they can't believe I'm Jesus is because I've said something um, that they believe um, isn't true about themselves, right? So, you know, I might, they might have come up and asked me, how do, I, how do I feel about their position with something? And most of the time they expect me to answer a certain way because they expect Jesus to answer a certain way. And of course, when I just tell them the truth, usually they can't handle that truth, generally emotionally. And so what they do is they get upset. And then, of course, they're looking for a reason to not listen to it. And of course, the, the easiest justification is he's not Jesus anyway, so I don't have to listen to him. So do you, would you say that the most common thing is that they don't give you a reason? The majority of people don't give me a reason other than saying that um, they know that I'm not Jesus. And I ask them how they know, and they just say, oh, oftentimes they just say, I just know. And that's it. But I know the majority of times why they have left. The majority of times I understand why they've left, because I've told them in advance what their issues are, that I know they'd eventually leave, as mm -hmm. a, the, listening to the divine truth, as a, as a, and use those particular things as reasons to leave. So for the majority of people, it is all about this issue of 
whenever they have an emotional confrontation of a belief system inside of themselves that they can't emotionally or believe they can't emotionally handle, they revert to the excuse of, he's not Jesus, so I'm not listening to him. But ironically, they will still listen to everybody else, even though everybody else isn't Jesus either. Right? Mm. <laughs> so that tells me it's not a very logical decision. You still listen to your wife and she's not Jesus. You, know, you still listen to your father and he's not Jesus. You still listen to your friends and they're not Jesus. And so you're saying you're not listening to the one guy because he's saying he's Jesus? Right? That doesn't make much sense, particularly when you listened to him before and you thought everything he said was logical about everyone else. So a lot of the, most of the time um, it's been to totally because of that one reason. So you said something they couldn't agree with? Yes. Or you, they have an expectation of you to be a certain way that you aren't? Yes, and in that regard, an uh, expectation that I'll be a certain way. For example, that most people have an expectation that I know everything. And I'm going, well, do you know everything? So I'm a person, I'm telling you I'm a man and I don't know everything. Because I'm a man. I'm not omniscient. You know, I'm not, I'm not God. I keep telling people I'm not God. And they go, but, but Jesus would know everything. I go, no, Jesus doesn't know everything. I'm sorry, I'm Jesus and I don't know everything. I'm telling you, Jesus doesn't know everything. And logically, it's impossible for me to know everything, actually. Because from, from God's perspective, God is infinite. All of God's truths are infinite. I'm a finite man who is slowly learning more and more of God's truths. At any one point in time, I will not know everything. I can't. In fact, my opinion is I know very little. <laughs> and, uh, and if you expect me to know everything, then you're expecting me to be God. That's not very reasonable when I've told you that I'm not God. <laughs> so even their expectations are way out of harmony with mm. what I'm teaching. So if a person, after listening to me, says, oh, you're not Jesus because you didn't get everything right, I go, but I've said I don't get everything right before I began. Before you knew me, I was saying that I didn't, don't get everything right. Even after I become at one with God, I'm not going to get everything right because knowledge is not the worry. The issue from God's perspective in terms of perfection is, are you perfect in love? Not are you perfect in knowledge. The only being in the universe who's perfect in knowledge is a person who doesn't exist in the universe, and that's God. God doesn't exist in the universe even because God's more infinite than the universe itself. So... God doesn't exist in the universe and God's the only person with all the knowledge, with all the truth. God's the only person. And if you expect me to be in the universe and be all-knowing, it's a physical impossibility because to be all-knowing, all I'd have to exist larger than the universe. And that's a physical impossibility too. So you're asking a lot of physical impossibilities by expecting me to be all-knowing. Scientifically, it's impossible for me to be all-knowing and exist inside the universe. So it makes no sense from a scientific perspective, from a physical perspective, from a spiritual perspective. It makes no sense at all that a person requires that I know everything. And yet there's a lot of people who come along to the seminars and when I don't have an answer for them, they go, well, he should know he's Jesus. Right? Basically you're saying he should know he's God. And I've already told you I'm not God. So you're not believing me when I say I'm not God. You expect me to be God. Jesus isn't God, never will be God, never can be God, because I am a created soul just the same as you are. That's the whole point. <laughs> you know? mm. So that, there's another, that's another reason why people feel that I can't be Jesus, because I'm not all-knowing. And I say, yeah, I'm not all-knowing. Yeah. Another reason why they say I can't be Jesus is because I make mistakes. But I say, of course I make mistakes. That's how you learn, actually. By making mistakes. So you're expecting me to be perfect before I'm perfect. You're expecting me to be perfect in knowledge, and only God can be that. And you're expecting me perfect in love before I'm perfect, and I've told you I'm not. So how can you expect me to be perfect in everything I do? I don't understand. Why would you stop listening on that basis? I don't stop listening to you, even though I know you're not perfect. <laughs> so why do you stop listening to me just because I'm not perfect? Can you see... For some reason, the rules about Jesus apply differently to everybody else. That's how everybody thinks. It's not true. I'm under the same rules of the same laws and the same government as God, uh, as God has imposed upon every one of her children. So, but, but everyone wants to believe that somehow the rules don't apply to me. 
which is a part of their false beliefs, mm -hmm. again being challenged. Mm -hmm. And yet they leave divine truth because of that. Well, I would never leave divine truth because of that. But that's just me. <laughs> what other reasons are there that I can think of that people say that they can't believe in Jesus? There's quite a lot, you know, that all get back to the same statement that they can't believe on Jesus, so therefore they can't listen anymore. Mm. 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 You've, you know most of them yourself, don't you? So. Yeah, it's mainly to do with, uh, I just see people get emotionally challenged by something that, that you do, or their, their perception of love is that love um, pleases Pandas. Pandas. Pandas to their addictions. Pleases their <coughs> addictions, makes mm. them feel comfortable all of the time. Yeah, not at all. And, and this is a, like, a, like a, the amount of times people come up to me and I can feel, yeah, you don't want the truth. You want to only hear what you are now going to ask me the question about and I know the answer you want already. I know, I know it before you begin. Right? I can feel it. I can even, a lot of times I can read people's minds. That's the truth. And I can feel their intention. Their intention is, ask a question, he'll give you the nice addiction being met because he's Jesus. He'll look after you. He'll make you feel good about yourself. And when I don't do that, they're just angry, angry, bitter and twisted. And there's been so many people that have come along to one seminar, came up, asked me a question, I give them an answer they don't want to hear and they never want to see me again and they spend the rest of their life criticising me on the internet. <laughs> just because they heard something they don't want to hear. Mm. And I find that's quite funny, really, and in some ways. It's sad. But I think it's sad for people. Well, it's I... funny in a way, too, because it, it just is an indication of how little they really wanted to hear the truth. They're claiming falsely to other people and themselves that they want to hear the truth. When they ask a question where somebody gives them the truth, they don't want to receive the answer. And, in fact, willing to abuse the person for the rest of their life that's an indication of how little they want to hear the truth. And it's see, quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> People live most of their lives like this. Like if they mm. say to their husband, does my bum look big in it? And he goes, well, yeah. Then, then most then women like, that's... Then a divorce. <laughs> well, not a divorce, but often like an no emotional... No sex for weeks on end. And <laughs> yeah. You said my mum's fat, so I'm not having sex with you now. Well, but, I mean, that's even more extreme than... Like most women maybe wouldn't be like that, but they would. there would be a chilling feeling towards of course. their husband for the next three hours. That's why most husbands are afraid to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's exactly the same thing. People don't want the truth and they're willing to be um, cruel in response to receiving the truth. Yes. They want to shoot the messenger, even mm. if the messenger is stating a truth. And, and even if they ask the question. And even if they ask the question. So they set up the messenger to be able to shoot him later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, you see this happening a lot in relationships and you see it happening a lot in life generally where people are set up so that you can shoot them down. And, and it, it's a cruel way of living your life mm. and it's certainly never going to be a life that's harmonious with God's love or God's laws and therefore never going to be a life of miracles <laughs> if we classify a miracle as living in harmony with God's higher laws. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I find it's... Uh, and although it's sad, it's a self-imposed thing that people have. So it's sad that they choose to do it, but it is also self-imposed. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's to do with the degree of arrogance that the average person has towards receiving truth. They don't want to receive it. And why don't they want to receive it? Because they don't want to feel the emotion involved in receiving it. Mm. You know, so the woman who's got a fat backside doesn't want to feel she's got a fat backside, even when she knows she has. She doesn't want to feel it, right? And she knows she's got to do something about it. And she might even feel powerless about doing something yeah. about it because of how her addictions lead her to eat or whatever it is that causes her to do it, right? To put on the weight in those locations. But she doesn't still want to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. She's got all this hurt she doesn't want to feel. If she was willing to feel all the hurt, Ironically, not only would she receive the truth, but the fat would fall off her backside. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same as all of us, really, in the end of the day. Yeah. If we were open to receiving the truth, not only would we receive the truth, but there would be benefits to our life as a result of receiving the truth that we would feel the rest of our lives.
What do you feel when people reject everything you say just because they can't accept your identity? Well, um, in terms of personal feelings, I don't feel personally hurt or any way. I just feel like, well, any conversation with them was fairly pointless because if that's the only reason why you're going to reject what somebody says because they're not Jesus or you don't believe they're Jesus when they're saying they are, then I, I suggest to the person it's not a very good reason to reject anything. Like, I, I don't reject them because they're not Jesus. So why would they reject me if they believe I'm not Jesus? Like, it doesn't make any logical sense to me. So my personal feelings are probably just one of uh, feeling a bit sorry for them, in fact, because I just feel sorry for anybody who rejects truth just because the person giving it isn't the person they want them to be. Or they reject truth because the person giving it doesn't meet their addictions and demands. Or the person uh, who's telling them the truth is not the person they hoped the person would be. Like, it's sad that anybody would reject truth on any of those bases. So I, I feel that uh, rejecting the truth for any of those reasons is not a good reason to reject truth. So for that reason, I accept truth from children because sometimes it's beautiful accepting the truth from children. Like, you, it is the truth and what they're saying to you is the truth. I accept people, truth from people who I know are just bitterly angry with me sometimes because I know, well, what they're saying is the truth. And I don't, I don't have any feeling they have to be something before I'll accept the truth from them. But there is this great feeling on this planet that you have to be someone important before people will listen to you. And I find that's pretty sad. Mm. Because it, why do you have to be someone important before anybody will listen to you? Like it doesn't make any sense to me either. Logically, we're all children of God, therefore we're all equal. Therefore each of us have a valid thing to say, right? And, and unless, and the more we say that's harmonious with love, the more valid it is. The less we say harmonious with love, then the less valid it is. It doesn't matter what they claim themselves to be. What matters is whether it's valid from a consideration of love or not. That's really the only real point of questioning, I feel, about whether you should receive something. Is, is it loving? Is the concept loving? Is it logical? Is it loving? then you would accept it no matter where it's from. So I feel that uh, people's reasons for, for doing that are fairly, you know, again, Ill illogically conceived. Mm. Mm. Okay. And I believe, though, that uh, for the majority of people, they have a strong desire to reject truth just because it's going to cause some of their own personal fears to be exposed. And rather than have their personal ex fears exposed and then have it have to be felt, they would prefer to have their personal fears suppressed. And the way to suppress fear is to tell a person a lie. So it's one of the main methods that we use on the planet in order to suppress a person's fear. So in a previous question, you talked about the fat woman's backside or the woman's fat backside, shall we say. <laughs> and the, the fear she has is that she has got a fat backside. And the fear she has is that she doesn't look good like that. And the fear she has is that other people will make fun of her like that. And the fear, you know, these fears all add up. And so when she goes up to her husband and do you think I look fat in these jeans, she's got all these preconceived fears whether they're valid or not, it's immaterial. She's got all of these fears that she doesn't want to feel. And she's really asking her husband to allay the fear, to make the fear go away. And the majority of people who come up to question me are questioning me because they want their fear to go away. They don't want to know the truth. They want their fear to disappear. And I'm not in the business of making fear disappear. In fact, I want fear to be exposed. I want fear to be addressed. That's what God wants. That's what all of God's laws are. are, are all God's laws are love-based and there is no fear in love. So all of God's laws are fearless and I would like people to address their fears. And so I'm not going to help a person, you know, sit in their fear. And I'm not going to say things to them that are going to help them do that. And a lot of people are very confronted with that. Mm. Mm. 
One of the things with regard to people terminating their friendship with me or rejecting things that I say, and a lot of times it is like a physical termination of the friendship. So they enter a friendship, a dialogue with me, they be, we become friends over time. Then I say something that generally confronts them and then they decide they're going to terminate their friendship and they write me a termination letter generally where they say, I, I, I no longer want to have anything to do with you because I don't believe you're Jesus. That's their termination letter mm -hmm. <laughs> that I receive mm -hmm. frequently from people. And unfortunately, most of the time, they are not honest with themselves. The very reason why they terminate their friendship with me, why they send me their termination letter, is because of reasons I've already exposed to them during my conversations with them, that they are unable to confront within themselves emotionally, that they're unable to accept emotionally. And often the very reason why they are terminating their friendship with me is the very reasons why I've, I, that I've already explained to them over the years that I've known them as to why they have a problem. So could you give us an example of that? Um, yes, I would probably give you many examples of that. <clears throat> Usually, within a very short period of time of knowing a person, they ask me, you know, what is going on for their lives personally. And usually I tell them what's going on in their life personally because they ask me and they seem to display a willingness to know. Of course, most of the time they're not really wanting to know. They just want me to say good things. Now, I'm willing to say good things if good things are there, but I'm also willing to say bad things if bad things are there. And that's what they don't understand. Uh, but the average person doesn't do that. So I tell them what's going on. So, for example, I gave one fellow, one fellow came to me and said, oh, look, I want to be your friend. And I said, well, look, it's impossible for me to be your friend because you're not real. You're faking your life constantly. Every interaction that I have with you is just a fake interaction. You don't, you're not real with any emotion. You don't have any emotions that are real that I can feel inside of you. And I, then I gave an example. See, right at the moment I said, now that I said that to you, you're in a rage with me. And you're not even acknowledging that. Anyway, that man drove off, right? And then he was about, he said later, he was about 15 k's away from me and he got into this huge rage with me and he wanted to kill me and he wanted to... And he spent two or three hours driving home wanting to kill me. He didn't see me for another five months as a result of that one conversation. He came back to me and told me how angry he was with me. And I said, but have you dealt with the fact that you're not being real? And he hadn't. And I said, are you going to? And to this day, he's now not coming to any sessions. He doesn't have anything to do with me. He wanted to be my friend, he said. He has nothing to do with me now. He's still angry with me and wants to kill me. He's told me on many occasions that he wants to kill me, <laughs> actually. Now, I find that, that whole experience, and that's a sort of extreme example of a person who has demonstrated to me right from the beginning what their true nature is. And I've told them right from the beginning what their true nature is. They haven't wanted to accept it right from the beginning. And now they don't spend any time with me for what they believe is, you know, the I'm not Jesus. So um, you're saying this person now in their rage, they're still not being real. They're just in a rage about you challenging them about not being real. Exactly. They're just in a rage about me challenging them about the fact that they're not real. And the fact is he wasn't real because if he wanted to be my friend, he wouldn't be in a rage with me for nearly five years now. Right? He wouldn't be in a rage with me. He, he, he would want to be my friend and therefore want to work through why he's in such a rage with me being a good friend to him, telling him the truth about himself, mm -hmm. right? He would want to work through that. So right from the beginning, I knew what the problem was, right? And this is frequently the case, that the people who send me their termination letters, I frequently know the exact reason why they're actually sending me their termination letter, and it's not because I'm not Jesus. It's because they don't like me, and they don't like what I said. Mm. And they don't like it and they don't like me because I told them the truth. And they don't want to hear the truth. That's the main reason why. So you're saying it's often at some point in your 
you can't really call it a friendship because you're saying that they don't like you. But no, some well, point that's right. In your, right from the beginning, they really haven't liked me. At some point so. in your relationship with these people, you've raised something mm -hmm. that ultimately become comes to a head. And when that comes to a head, either with you or in some aspect of their, their, personal, their, life. their personal life, and you reflect the truth about that, yep. then they don't want to have anything to do with you. No. I can certainly vouch for that. I mean, I observe that all the time. It happens with me now too. Well, you like, think of it all the time. You didn't want to have anything to do with me. It was pretty much the same, wasn't it? Certainly. certainly. I was personally challenged. Every yeah. single time. And yep. you just wanted to walk away. You wanted to go away. And then, to your credit, you walked away, went around, and you went, he's right, I'm a... And you know what I mean. You you had this feeling in you of uh, of, of at least some degree of self honesty. But the average person I find doesn't have that. They have no degree of self honesty. They don't want to examine themselves honestly, and so they would just want to blame somebody for mm. what they do. I feel to the people's credit who stay, the majority of them have a larger degree of self honesty. They. They have a desire to see themselves as they truly are, even though it's painful at times. And, and that's the exact same desire I have for myself, mm -hmm. the desire to see myself as truthfully are, even though it's painful at times for me too. You know, that's the reality. That's the reality any time we walk towards God, but God's going to expose our true nature to ourselves. And it's just whether we can emotionally be humble enough to deal with it as to whether we will stick in this desire to have a relationship with God or not. That's the primary thing driving our desire. Mm -hmm. So for the average person, they don't have that desire. They don't have this strong desire to be at one with God. They don't have a strong desire to have personal reflection of truth. And so they want people to tell them lies. And when you tell them the truth, they view that as a mortal sin, which they will remain angry about until they see that you were right. And until they see that it's not very loving to be angry, and until they see that once they get over their anger that actually they had a lot of fear about the answer, and until they actually feel their fear and feel the grief that is their fear covers, they probably are not going to shift on the issue. Mm. Mm. What do you believe are the true reasons people can't believe that you are Jesus? Well, I don't believe it has anything to do with me being Jesus, actually. I feel quite strongly that it's impossible for anybody to prove that I'm not Jesus, uh, just as it's uh, difficult for me to prove that I am, given the circumstances that we're currently in at the moment. However, I do feel the main reasons why people uh, don't believe that I'm Jesus or say they don't believe I'm Jesus is because they are physically confronted, spiritually confronted, emotionally confronted, psychologically confronted, belief system confronted, and um, what else can I include in that? they basically confronted on every single level a person can be confronted. Their family is confronted. Their life is confronted. Their Damn. world view is confronted. <laughs> everything is confronted. And when everything is confronted, usually the psychological disturbance of having so many belief systems confronted at the same time is so great for the average person that they have to look for a way out of the confrontation. And just to clarify, these things are confronted by you or by divine truth or what are they the confronted truth. by? The truth confronts all of these things. The real truth, God's truth, confronts these things. And I'm going to state God's truth. So naturally, I'm going to be seen to be the person who's at the spearhead of the confrontation. In other mm -hmm. words, they're going to blame me for the confrontation. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how many people blame me for their family getting angry with them. Like, I'm not their family. I'm not angry with them. <laughs> but their family's getting angry with them just because they listen to me and they blame me for it. Like, why do you blame me for it? It's your family that's getting angry with you. Blame them. <laughs> right? So the main reason why that happens is because they're confronted on so many levels. So spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically... Uh, confronted, where worldviews confronted, everything's confronted. And as a result of the confrontation, the confrontation is so great internally. There's so much internal, what I refer to in my discussions as stretching that needs to occur, but which they see as internal confusion and internal pain, that they have to look for a scapegoat. And because I've been the source, 
of much of the information that's confronted them. The scapegoat automatically becomes myself. And that's the main reason why the average person who leaves the teachings of divine truth leaves the teachings of divine truth, because they're confronted in some way. Most of them are confronted before they even begin. They're confronted as soon as I open my words and say, look, I'm Jesus and I'm going to tell you something. That's when they're confronted. Just me saying that I'm Jesus confronts them right, in so many ways. And, and the confrontation begins there and grows from that point, generally. So what happens to people when they're confronted on all these different levels? Well, they hit the point where they feel they cannot emotionally cope with the confrontation. And in other words, they're not humble enough to, conf- to, to actually absorb the com- internal conflict that occurs as a result of all of this information. And because of the lack of humility... And their, in other words, their inability to feel every emotion that they're feeling at the time without blaming somebody else. They revert to blaming somebody else for their emotional condition. And of course, usually at that point, that's when they get angry. So they get very angry, even rageful at times. Some of them even become like they want to kill you, so rageful, because they're psychologically disturbed on so many levels. That, uh, that it's very, very difficult for them to maintain any sense even of what would be normally classified as kind or considerate behaviour. So what's the major emotion that comes up for people? Would you say...? Well, the major emotion is fear, obviously, uh-huh. but, but that's not the emotion they display. The emotion that they display most of the time is rage or anger. Mm-hmm. which is a covering over of the fear. And, and it's because their addiction is not getting met. So, so for the majority of people, they are in heavy addictions with the life or, that they have. They're, they have addictions with their friends, with their family, with their food, with their clothes, with their shelter. With their, mm-hmm. <laughs> there's so many addictions that's on every level. And, and the addictions are used to cover over their fears. And then as I expose their addictions, there's nothing left to cover over fear, and when there's nothing left to cover over fear and you're not prepared to feel fear, you get angry. And when you get angry, you get very unpleasant. You become unkind and inconsiderate. You are willing to harm another person in their life. And in most people's cases, they then want to have a personal vendetta with me. They want to express this personal vendetta for the rest of their life, which is an indication of how much they are lacking development in love. Because the reality is you'd never want to do that if you love somebody. It's also a lack of development in not just love but logic, isn't it? Or... Of course. Uh, but, but a person generally is very illogical once their emotions are triggered. They become very illogical if they are unable to be humble. So when, when we have an inability to be humble, we become very illogical in the way in which we handle emotion. So we handle emotion by becoming angry and, and vindictive and even resentful and even murderous at times as a result of our inability to be humble. And so it's the lack of humility that really drives a lot of this kind of behaviour. So the main reason why people say to me that they can't listen to me anymore because I'm saying that I'm Jesus is because they lack humility. That's the main problem that they have. And in, in some ways I don't mind because... If they lack humility with me, they certainly are going to lack humility with God, who I'm being trained by. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm. and so they're not ever really going to have a, a condition of at one with God unless they're willing to engage humility as an active quality that they personally want to develop. And given the world and the world's um, general fear of humiliation and general fear of being looked down upon and the fear of condescension and so forth, I would suggest that the average person doesn't want to become humble. They don't want to feel all of their real feelings that they actually feel and acknowledge the truth of their real feelings. And as a result of that, they are in a lot of addiction to have avoid these fears and then, of course, project a lot of rage as a result. Uh, and so what happens in your relationship with these people when they project rage at you? Well, the main reason why I, you know 
have a person leave my life, withdraw from a person, the only reason why, in fact, I withdraw from people is because they're angry with me or they're treating me badly in some way. And the reality is if I love myself and I'm practising the truth that I preach, I will love myself. And if I love myself, I will, in fact, not put up with people treating me angrily or bitterly or blaming me for things that I have not created. I will not put up with people treating me in, unlo in an unloving manner. I won't put up with them yelling at me. I won't give them my time, more of my time, when they're already shown in the past that they're willing to treat me badly when I have given them my time for free. So I will withdraw from them as a result. That's the only time I will withdraw from a person. And, uh, and if I can leave their presence um, and go to my home, I will. If I can't leave their presence or I am in an environment that I've created, then they have to leave me. That's why I ask people who are angry and bitter in any of our seminars to leave because they're in my environment and I don't deserve their rage. No matter what I am and what I've done, I still don't deserve their rage, just like I don't believe they deserve mine. Right? So that's the primary reason why I leave people um, myself. That's why I make the decision personally to leave them. However, the majority of people are not in that place. The majority of people um, usually leave me before I leave them. And I feel the reason for that is that I'm a lot more tolerant of, of unloving behaviour than the average person, unfortunately. But um, people, sorry. Sorry, go on. <laughs> but people leave you not because You've been angry with them, though. No. Like, the only time you leave someone is if they're angry, angry with, with you. But they don't leave you because you're angry with them. They leave you for other reasons, no, don't they? Nobody's left me because I'm angry with them because I haven't been angry with them. Yes. <laughs> so um, you know, the reality is I just tell them the truth of the situation and then they become challenged and angry and bitter. Or Some, some people feel ashamed and so they leave or whatever. But uh, very few people actually let themselves feel, in humility, feel their emotions as a result and stay, mm -hmm. which I feel is the best course of action to take. That's the course of action I take uh, when I'm dealing with people generally. So that's the course of action I suggest to other people to take. But it's not generally the course of action others engage. So basically, though, in answering this question, you've said that um, the true reasons that people leave you or, or leave, decide let's that say they not can't. leave me because it's not leaving me. I don't see it as leaving me. They decide they can't listen to divine truth anymore. In other words, they're deciding that they can't listen to God's truth anymore because of, and most of the, most of the time on the end of that sentence, they say, because you're not Jesus, mm -hmm. which doesn't make any logical sense to me. And I know for a fact that the majority of them are not leaving for that reason. They're leaving because they've been emotionally, spiritually, belief system, worldview-wise, psychologically disturbed <laughs> through something that I've said. So they've been very challenged they've by that. Challenged. What about the influence of others? Well, of course, one of the reasons why people have left has been the influence of others, you know, whether the others are spirits or people on earth. You know, at one point in time, we had people who knew us ringing other people, trying to convince them not to come to our seminars for free. You know, they come to our seminars for free. And we've got people who are so committed against ourselves that they are willing to ring up all the people they know who are still coming to seminars and tell them not to come to seminars anymore um, because they don't go to seminars anymore. That's how much they want the approval of other people in order to make the choice or the decision to not listen to divine truth. I feel quite strongly that a lot of their decisions are made for these reasons. And then there are also this heavy spirit influence. Of course, there are a large group of spirits, billions in fact of spirits who do not want this divine truth, God's truth to be on earth. If God's truth comes to earth in a full way, most of these spirits will no longer be able to have their addictions met. Most of these spirits will no longer be able to influence people in the manner they currently do. Most of these people in the spirit world will not be able to have a detrimental effect on the planet as a result. Now, most of those spirits are fully committed to having a detrimental effect on the planet. They're fully committed to being evil and they're fully committed to trying to affect every single person on earth negatively. And so, of course, they're not going to be very happy when somebody comes along talking God's truth. 
And so many people come under their influence very rapidly when we're with them. But when we're not with them, they're not influenced. And then they go, yeah, the, the influence around Jesus and Mary or AJ and Mary is very dark. Well, yes, I agree. It's very dark. There's a lot of spirits around us trying to convince you that we're not who we're saying we are and trying to convince you that what we're teaching is not divine truth. And those people follow us around constantly looking for a new prey every single moment that we're speaking, right? So, so this is a fact of the life we're living, just it was, as it was a fact of the life I lived in the first century. When I was in the first century, as the Bible does actually say, the spirits were often around me, the dark spirits were often around me, trying to convince other people that what I was speaking wasn't the truth, trying to convince other people that it was all a lie. This is a fact of life living here on earth, and it won't change until people on earth stop being governed by fear and start feeling their fear instead, being humble to their fear. But that is another reason why a lot of people leave. A lot of people become this, they become so disturbed internally that they are so easily influenced by people on earth and by spirits to not listen anymore, that they don't listen anymore. Only to their own regret later, generally. Mm. So basically you're saying that people meet you, they hear some divine truth. Usually they like it. Usually they like it, but it, at some point there's a, there's a stretch or there's a challenge of mm -hmm. their worldview, of their um, comfort zone. Or and most of the their... time it's not their worldview. It's most of the time it's a challenge of their personal emotional condition. Mm -hmm. In other words, they want to believe they are in this condition and I'm telling them, sorry, but you're not in the condition you believe you are. At that point, there's a lot of psychological distress or emotional distress or fear. Yes. And then you mentioned logic sort of goes out the window. Logic goes out the window. And most people then revert to saying, well, look, you're not Jesus and so I'm leaving. Yes, which uh, is illogical reason for leaving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they can't prove it. So, and, and that isn't all an indication that they're skipping over the real major points, the major points of why they're leaving. Like, I had another friend, you know, the only reason why he left was because his wife didn't like me anymore. But he told me it was because I'm not Jesus. And this is what happens. Like, you know, he's afraid of his wife. Mm. And I told him that right from the beginning, that he's afraid of women. I told him that that was his biggest emotion and that if he didn't let go of it, he'll never be at one with God right at the beginning of our relationship. Mm. And what is the thing that terminated our relationship? Not me not being Jesus, but rather the exact thing I said, which was his fear of his wife and his wife's emotions. And these are, this is common. This is common, as you know. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I feel that if people are going to leave divine truth or and not listen, choose to not listen to God's truth anymore, my suggestion to them is this. Make sure you've at least listened to some of it before you make the decision. <laughs> make sure you make a logical decision. Make sure you know the reason why you're leaving. And make sure you're honest with yourself about the reason why you're leaving. Because otherwise, you're just wasting your own time, in fact. It would be far better for you to do those things. Than it would we be have another way. friend who recently <coughs> told us that she didn't want to feel any emotions and she didn't want to prevent us speaking truth, so she didn't want to see us anymore. To and me, I that's feel that's much honest. more honest. Yeah. yeah. I feel that's much more honest. It, it, it's sad in the sense that she, we still feel her to be our friend. Yeah. And it's sad in the sense that it's not helping her life in the future, mm. but it's honest. You know, she's being honest about it and that's great. And, uh, you know, you've got to respect people like that that are honest about it. Um, when people just say they're leaving because they don't believe on Jesus, you know, that's not honest. That, that, there's no honesty there. Mm. They're not being honest with themselves or with me. And I know they're not, you know. And most of the time, the very reason why they're leaving, I told them right at the beginning of the time that I knew them, mm. what, what, you know, what the problem was. So I feel, you know, for the average person... Like, we're, we're perfectly okay with people leaving, of course. And we feel that this is the beauty of free will. You have the choice, you know, you can make choices and decisions. If you leave God's truth, it's not going to be a good life for you. That's the fact. Because, because you're leaving the way the universe is governed. You're leaving God's laws. You're choosing to act in disharmony with God's laws. 
And when you choose to act in harmony with God's universal laws, there are consequences. It's like, you know, stepping off of a building, you know, the law of gravity is going to take its effect. And <laughs> in disharmony. You said in harmony, but you mean Sorry, in disharmony. Yeah, in disharmony. Like, you know, if you step off a building, the law of gravity will take its effect. Now, if you step off a big enough building, the law of gravity is going to take its effect and it's not going to be very pleasant. <laughs> Even a small building, it's not going to be very pleasant. You're going to hit the ground with some pretty strong force and potentially break a bone. And that's just the result of breaking the law. Mind you, I feel that you can leave like what we teach and live a moral life. You yes, can, and that would and, be in harmony with many laws. And that would be in harmony with so many you'd laws. Have a good and life. It, it doesn't mean that everything's going to go terribly for you. In no, fact, not you, at all. if you listened to Divine Truth for five years and then went, well, that's it, but I'm just going to live a very moral life. That would be and fantastic. And before then, you didn't have one at all. You're in a better condition. Heaps better. So I don't feel like it's all hell and damnation if you leave no, divine no. truth. I just don't. It's just that everyone, you're better off learning about God's laws, even if you can't accept them. Because if you know what they are, you can decide to live in harmony with them or not as a decision. Mm -hmm. Right? If you don't learn about God's laws, then, uh, then oftentimes you're acting in ignorance. And the, the consequences of ignorance are just the same as the consequences are similar to the consequences of willful disobedience. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I don't know there's a law of gravity and I still step off the, if I step off the roof not knowing there's a law of gravity, the law of gravity is still going to work, <laughs> right? So whether I'm ignorant of the law or not, it's still going to have its consequence. Of course, the consequences are slightly different in terms of emotionally because if I did it willfully, then I'll have additional conscience matters to work through. So it's from a soul perspective, the, there is a difference. But, but there is a similar consequence to the same action, whether it was willful or not. Mm -hmm. And this is what people need to understand. It's like you're far better off knowing about God's laws and not doing it than you are not knowing. Knowing about God's laws and not following them, you mean? Mm -hmm. And then you are of not Of not knowing, knowing. yeah. There, there's no such thing as blissful ignorance. That's the truth. And, you know, blissful ignorance creates a lot of pain. It's not blissful at all. <laughs> it's far better to not be ignorant and still decide. You know, at least you know why you got into trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but even better than that would be to, to know the truth and decide to live in harmony with it. Mm. That would be even better. That's, where, that's what's going to result in the most beautiful life and the most loving life and the most pleasurable life. Mm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm. What, if anything, do you do about the reasons that most people reject you? Well, there's nothing I can do. Um, from God's perspective, if I honour all of God's laws, and particularly the law of free will, which is a very, very important law that God has created, a gift that God's given to each of us individually, then there is nothing I can do about somebody not listening anymore. There's nothing I want to do about somebody not listening to more, any, me anymore. In fact, I fully support their desire and right to not listen to me anymore, just as I fully support my desire and right to not listen to anybody else anymore, if that's what I choose. So there's nothing I can actually do or want to do. I don't want to force them. I don't want to impel them. I don't want to convince them. I don't want to motivate them. I don't want to give them a motivational speech. I, I just want to let them make their own choice. If their own choice is to not listen, then don't listen anymore. That's fine. I'm okay with that. You can even be my friend and not listen anymore. That's the reality. I've got many friends who don't listen to Divine Truth and still are my friends and I talk to them about other matters. Now, in terms of trying to assist them to get over whatever is the emotional confrontation that they feel, as the reason, the real reason why they don't want to listen to me, me anymore. Well, there's already over a thousand hours of, of material on YouTube, which would already be helping them do that. The majority of these people have also uh, had some of their personal questions answered by me. And so really I've done all I can already to help them through the confrontation they're experiencing as to the reason why they don't want to listen anymore. And for the majority of people, it just means that they haven't been humble enough to listen to that advice or take into account those particular things. In fact, for the majority of people, 
they listen for a while. They haven't listened to the whole thousand hours. They've listened for a while until something confronts them. And at the point that something confronts them, that's the point when they want to walk away. And my suggestion to people is that's, you're not going to grow that way. The only way you grow is by being stretched, <laughs> you know. And so, so you can't expect to grow by only listening to the things that you agree with. You know, you're never going to grow that way. So at the point where we hit something that it's very challenging, instead of immediately seeking internal justifications to not listen, mm -hmm. there's the choice to look at what's being challenged. Yes, at that point we have a choice. And most people make the choice to not listen anymore at that point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they make that choice is because they're challenged and they don't want to be humble to what the channel challenge is. They don't want to feel it emotionally. And so rather than feeling it emotionally, they wish to walk away from what they believe is the trigger of the, the confrontation emotionally that's occurring within them. So at that point, they make a choice to leave rather than deal. Now, this is the same kind of choice the average person makes when they go and see a psychologist. They go to a psychologist and while the psychologist is telling them things they want to hear, then they stay engaged. But as soon as the psychologist tells them something that they don't want to hear, they want to run away. And they go away usually for good, you know. That is the choice that they make. And unfortunately, that proves that they really didn't want to change in the first place. Not enough to confront their emotional reasons why they don't want to change. If we're willing to confront the emotional reasons why we don't want to change, we would go through the emotion that the confrontation has caused and come out the other end of it. But most people don't come out the other end of it. They make the choice to avoid the emotional confrontation. So they leave the source of the confrontation. Now, in my case, because I'm often viewed as the source of the confrontation, because I'm stating something that they don't want to accept, they leave. And I'm okay with that, like I said, it's fine. That's their choice. They have a choice to make and that's their choice. Yeah. My suggestion to people is this. They don't need a reason to stop listening to me. The way God's made their free will is that they're allowed to choose to not listen to me without having a reason at all. You don't have to come along to the sessions. What I notice a lot of people doing is they almost feel guilt, guilt when they don't come to a session or they feel guilt when they don't come to a seminar that's in their region. They feel sort of, it's almost like this macabre uh, pull towards going when they don't really want to go because they know they're going to get confronted when they go, right? And they don't really want to go, but they go anyway. And then, of course, they get confronted. And then they feel they've got to make some kind of justification for why they don't want to go anymore. And so what they do then is they start inventing reasons to not go. And most of the inventions are all around things that I've already told them are true. So, for example, the one invention that they often have is you, don't, you make mistakes. Yes, I've told you that. That's correct, I do make mistakes. But I told you that from the beginning. So why would you not want to listen anymore just because I make mistakes? Now, that doesn't make any sense. When I told you from the beginning I do make mistakes, you obviously either didn't believe me at the beginning or now you're just using that as an excuse to not listen now. Or they might say you know, to me things like, oh, I don't believe you're Jesus anymore. Well, you can't prove that. So that makes no sense to me at all. Right? You can't prove that I'm not Jesus. So how, how does that make any sense that that's a good reason to stop listening now? You were listening before, why aren't you listening now? There must be a different reason. Right? And then the reality is you don't need a reason to stop <laughs> listening. Yeah. You're allowed to stop listening at any time. It's all free. It's not like you've committed to some hundreds of hours of teaching. It's not like you've entered a university degree that you've paid for and now you've got to finish even though you don't want to finish it. You can leave at any time. Nothing is going to worry. No one's going to be bothered by that. I'm still going to love you. You, you, don't, you, you can leave at any point you want. Then they say to me things like, but you don't get things, you know, you're not all-knowing. But I've told you that I'm not all-knowing. I've told you that Jesus is not all-knowing. So how is that now a reason? So forget using all these so-called excuses. My suggestion to you is this. If you don't want to come along to the session, 
don't come along. You don't have to give anybody a reason. You don't have to come up with fanciful reasons. You don't have to come up with illogical reasons. Stop trying to convince yourself that you have a logical reason. Just say to yourself, I don't want to go. And don't come. <laughs> For, and it doesn't matter what the reason is that you don't want to go. I like that's what I feel. That's why we make the sessions for free. People have the free will then to make a choice at any moment. They can get up and leave at any moment. They don't have to come back. And certainly we don't uh, go looking for them. <laughs> we don't go looking for them. Nor do we uh, We don't advertise them for them. They... We don't market for them. No, no, I mean, we don't go looking for people who do stop coming. Of course, we don't go yeah. knock on their door like other religions, uh, like religions do, like I've had done to me, knocking on my door saying, why aren't you coming back? And we don't do that. We, we leave people make their own choice and decisions. They're allowed to do that. Of course they're allowed to do that. That's their God-given gift. And I, it's always mystified me that when people decide that they don't agree with divine truth, then they feel that they should or that it's good or that, that, that they want to abuse us hmm. when we haven't forced anything upon anyone. No, nor have uh, we abused anyone. We've not abused them and, and now they feel like they can't let it go. Like for me, yeah. if I want to let something go, I stop going and I move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. The fact that they can't let it go though indicates something, doesn't it? Of course, yes. You see, what happens with truth, God's truth, when it hits our soul, it, after a while it starts resonating with our soul and we just can't give it up no matter what we want to do. <laughs> we might want to give it up, but we just can't. And for a lot of people, they get angry about that. They get angry about the fact they can't give it up. So, so instead of uh, you know, just having a good bash on a punching bag or something and letting go of all that rage that they have about the fact that now God's truth, they've heard God's truth, they can't forget it anymore. Instead of having a good rage about that, which is one thing they do need to have a good rage about, obviously, um, they would rather be in a rage with the people they heard it from. Who have not harmed them? All they've ever, you know, all we've ever done is just present truth for free to them. We've given them our time for free. How can you be complaining about that? Like you didn't have to sit there and have spend the time with us. You could have got up at any moment. So why are you angry about it? All right? You're only angry about it because there's something inside of you that resonates with it that you don't want to face, and you don't want to feel that from an emotional perspective. So in other words, you lack humility. That's the only reason why you're angry with us, because you lack humility. That's, I'm not angry with you because I don't have that same lack of humility. Right? I'm more humble than that. I can see that every time I get upset inside of myself, it's got something inside of myself, not anybody else to blame. And that's the difference between ourselves generally and the people who listen to us. Most of the people who listen to us get angry with us at some point because they lack humility. They lack that ability to be able to see that any feeling they have is not the result of somebody else, but the result of something they're feeling inside of themselves. Mm. Yeah, also I'd like to say on this subject that, you know, when people withdraw from us, we still feel a lot of love for them, actually. The majority of people who have listened to us and who have left, and even the majority of people who are angry with us, we still feel a lot of love and compassion for them. We see the reasons why they feel confronted at the time and we also can understand perhaps better than they do at this point in time as to why they feel so angry with us. And we believe that at some point in the future they will possibly work through their rage and anger and actually get into a condition where they see that they were just afraid and, uh, and need to work through their fears and see that they just wanted some addictions met that we weren't meeting and maybe they can work through some of their addictions. So we actually have a lot of uh, feelings of, of love towards all the people who have left hearing the divine truth and who have left coming along to the seminar, don't come along to seminars anymore or anything like that. And it's not like there are regular seminar attendees or anything. It's just, you know, we notice when people have withdrawn from us and we don't feel angry with them for withdrawing from us. But if they treat us badly during that process, then of course there's a lot more uh, resistance in us towards having a relationship with them in the future. So when I say resistance in us, what we're waiting for is their own repentance for 
their angry behaviour. And what we find for the majority of people is that they are not repentant for their angry behaviour and uh, because they feel justified by being angry. They justify their behaviour. They are justifying their addictions. And so for the majority of people, they're going to need a lot more humility to return to hearing God's truth or divine truth than they have had had to listen to it in the first place. Because after they've left, many people have become angry and resentful. When they become angry and resentful, they're demonstrating their lack of love and also their lack of concern for proper ethics. And as a result of that, the next time we engage with them, the very first thing we're going to address with them is their lack of love and lack of ethics. And of course, unless they've dealt with those particular emotions, they're going to find that confrontation much more confrontational than any previous confrontation they've had. <laughs> so um, I'd suggest to any person who's left uh, listening to Divine Truth and is now considering uh, listening to it again, that they look sincerely at the reasons why they left. And it actually had nothing to do most of the time with what they told us the reasons were that they left or what they believed were the reasons they left, but rather have a lot more to do with their inability to be humble to all of their own emotions, the inability to feel everything they feel without blaming other people. That's the primary reason why anybody leaves anything. Mm. Leaves anything? Yeah. Like, you know, we have two primary reasons why we leave anything. One is because we leave and we're not emotionally connected to it at all. The second reason is because we have huge emotions about it and we're angry. <laughs> now, my suggestion to people is the majority of times they have left divine truth, it's because they are angry and they're resentful. It's not because they just have no connection to it. It's because they're angry and resentful, which is not the average reason why people leave other things. People leave other things because they don't have an emotional connection to it, you mean? Yeah, most yeah. people leave other things because they don't have an emotional connection to it. Yeah. Right? And, but the majority of people who leave Divine Truth leave because they have an emotional connection to it, but they're angry. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 But they are the two primary reasons why we leave anything. We don't have an emotional connection or we do and we're angry. <laughs> <laughs> they are the two reasons, generally. Yeah. Yeah, mm. no, I agree with that. Just... Um, you know, sometimes we leave abusive situations, but if we leave them because either we've worked We're through... angry or we don't have an emotional connection Exactly, anymore. yeah, no, Usually. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the people who leave an abusive situation because they don't have an emotional connection anymore, that's great. That means that they're no longer hooked into mm. accepting the abuse from an emotional perspective. Yeah. Right? So that's fantastic. The people who leave emotional abuse because they're angry are still hooked in to the addiction that wasn't getting met through the, through the abuse. Yeah. And, uh, and that means that they're probably going to attract more abuse mm -hmm. in their future. It's not a good reason to leave anything because you're angry because you're still going to attract the events you're angry about. Yeah, I agree. Mm. It's, it's very important to point out that we do not threaten people. We don't threaten people that they must come along to our seminars. We invite them to come along to our seminars. We don't try to chain up people when they're there. We don't pressure them to stay. We don't pressure them to donate. We don't pressure them to support us. We don't pressure them to leave unless they're being abusive. There is no pressure at all that we've put on people. We don't threaten them if they do leave that they can never come back. Right? None of these things actually occur. So. The reality is that we are very, very conscious of the way in which people express their free will. Now, if they have a problem with me and my identity, they can leave at any time. But I suggest to them that a problem with my identity isn't the real problem, right? Because they don't have a problem with other people not being Jesus. So, so the problem with my identity is, is greater than that. And this is what they need to find. They need to find the real reason why they have the problem as the reason why they don't wish to listen anymore. Now, I'm not saying they have to in the sense because they can leave at any time. They have the right to leave for no reason at all. 
However, it's not going to be beneficial to their future to leave when you blame it on one thing when it's really another. You really want to find out why you left if you really want to progress with your future life, even if you don't want to listen to God's truth. You still want to find out why you leave mm. and really understand the reason why you leave rather than blaming it on some illogical reason, such as he's not Jesus, which is a very illogical reason for leaving anything. Mm. So that would be my suggestion to them. We, myself and yourself, as you know, we love them still. We mm. love people and if they want to come back at any time, we're happy for them to come back at any time. They can come back and leave and come back and leave, just as you've done many times in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and there's no like animosity that's harboured against a person for doing such a thing. Just make sure you're doing it for the right reasons. That's the main thing. There is little that I can do about um, a person's lack of logic or lack of love or lack of desire for truth or lack of usage of their own will in harmony with love. There's little I can do to help them in those particular situations. There's little I can do to help them be humble. I can talk about humility. I can talk about the need for them to experience all of their own emotions, which includes experiencing all of their own emotional and psychological distress. But if a person doesn't want to do that, there is nothing that anybody can do, even God can do for them. So my suggestion to a person is this. If they are confronted by something that I'm saying, including when I'm saying that I'm Jesus, let themselves feel their emotional distress. Be humble to what it is they're truly feeling. What is the real reason why? They feel the way they feel. Allow themselves to feel that. If you allow yourself to feel that, you're being humble. If you're humble, you will grow in your relationship with God. You might not necessarily want to listen to Jesus for a while, but you still will be humble in your growth towards God if you're humble to all of your own emotions. But if you blame something that is not to blame in reality from God's perspective, then all you're doing is you're fooling yourself. And therefore, you are not going to progress towards God, no matter what you choose to do and who you choose to listen to. So I feel, in probably conclusion to this session of questions, the issue of me being Jesus or not is certainly an issue that you're going to have to resolve at some point in your future. Only because uh, for your own uh, areas of confusion, really. But using it, as a reason to not listen to truth is a very stupid reason for not listening to truth. It's very foolish. Using it as a reason to not absorb love, to live in harmony with love, is a very silly reason to not be loving. My suggestion is if you're using the excuse of my own identity in order to not be loving or not be truthful in your own day-to-day -day life or not live a moral life, then all you're doing is creating an excuse for a different thing that's real, for a different reality. In other words, you really have other reasons. You don't want to be moral or you don't want to live in harmony with truth or you don't want to be loving and you're not willing to face up to that. And instead, you wish to blame me because I'm saying I'm Jesus as a reason for not listening or not practising what you hear. I suggest to people, you don't have to practice what you hear from me. I don't expect you to practice what you hear from me. I don't expect you to believe that I'm Jesus. I don't expect you to understand my life. I don't expect you to question me. I don't expect you to listen to me. I don't expect you to come along to my seminars. And I don't expect you to donate to me. And I don't expect that you ever believe in your entire future that what I'm saying is true. I don't expect any of those things. If you think that my saying I'm Jesus means that I expect those things, then that's your emotional baggage, not mine. And what I suggest to you is deal with that emotional baggage rather than projecting it at myself. Mind you, you're allowed to project it at me as well if you wish to. You're allowed to dump it all on me if that's what you desire, but it's not going to be very good for your future because you're not being honest with yourself. 
So I don't know if we will have that many more questions about my own identity. I feel the reality is I've said all there probably is to say in these sessions about my identity. And I would like to now get on to subjects perhaps about Mary's identity because that hasn't been addressed at this point. So we'll probably go through some questions about Mary's identity. But we're more focused on wanting to now talk about frequently asked questions relating to truth and God and laws and principles and ethics and morality and all of these kind of truths because we feel that these kind of truths are far more important for anybody to understand than, you know, issues about our personal identity. But we'd like to thank you for listening to all of our questions about um, all of these answers that we've given to your questions, in fact, about identity. And uh, hopefully they've been enlightening enough to, to confront some concepts and ideas that you have about my identity and Mary's identity. Thanks for your time. Thank you.